And then, you know, I was reading up on you. And then I was, I was like, same guy? So then I pulled up the video, same guy. That's awesome. Are you guys still doing Man, we're doing it hardcore. Okay. All right, we're gonna. We want to come back to Salt Lake. Well, that's to Sandy next year, man. Is what we want to do. Have you, played, have you guys played here yet? No. In okay, fact, this I didn't is... realize that you guys had had such a vibrant both gaming community and like just the the, the cons. Like your Comic Con is giant. It's yeah. like going to San Diego Comic Con. It's yeah. huge out here. So you guys have heard of Critical Hit, right? Is okay. Do you I think? I that you have. I, no one's heard of Critical Hit. Critical Hit. Just a few people have. Okay. We're new. Here, here's the thing. I, I assume since you're here, you also go to the Comic Con, right? Yeah. Most of you? All right. I, so I've been doing like the video game music stuff uh, involved with these guys for like two, three years. And I've been pushing so hard to get musical acts to be part of this because I think it would just make it even that much. Like, it'd be cool to have a stage set up. Like, it could go on con, come out, relax, see some cool music for an hour, go back into the con. You know what I mean? I think it adds, anyway. So we'll talk about that. I would that love it. I would love it. It would be so cool to come out for that. Because I'm going to need your help into bugging them to say, yeah, we would love to see Critical Hit here in September. You know what I mean? That kind of sweet. thing. So That would be sweet. Yeah, because they got Rika the first year, but they didn't quite let her. Yeah. Did you go to that panel? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. And see, that's why every time they bring people here, I'm always trying to push. I don't know why I'm being quiet on the mic. They can still hear me. I just been well, lots of. I do. Yeah. You're right. Come on in. Feel free. Find a seat. This is gonna be awesome. Jason Hayes. But there's been lots of stuff with Jess Harnell. So I still have not met him or even seen the group, but I hear it's pretty special. So yeah. I want to reach out to him and see if maybe he can come if we come back and stuff and. Come do a tune I, together with him, it'd be awesome. I he think is you. coming in September. Yeah. See, so this is... Because we've done collabs before, like, it, it, we've had, yeah. We've done some fun stuff with that. Wow, this is going to be good. All right. So we'll give everyone just... We'll start here in a minute. I've got some questions for Mr. Hayes. And then we're some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, uh, we're going to split the time. So I'm going to ask him about 20 minutes worth of questions, 15, 20 minutes. But then we're going to split it and open up the mic. So anything that you guys want to ask. I want it to be more about your questions and my questions. But there are some things I, you know, background. Anyway. Should we start? Let's just start. Can we start? Yeah. Volunteer? Okay, cool. All right, so um, everyone, my name is Mark Dago. I do music here locally. I specifically like to do um, rap music, video game inspired, where I sample old Nintendo tunes and put raps over. Uh, cool. <laughs> and uh, you can get most of my stuff for free, uh, markdago.bandcamp.com. So if you want, just go in there and check it out. I sample just a ton of old stuff from like 88 to like 91-ish. So. Uh, this here, however, is Jason Hayes, everyone. Let's give him a good Salt Lake City welcome. You guys like video game music, correct? Yeah. yeah. That's why you're here. All right. So um, let's just uh, get right into it. Uh, how did you get started in your music career? So I got started when I was, uh, I was living in Louisiana. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. And I started writing musical jingles for uh, radio ads. Not big, huge, AAA jingles. I mean, I wrote, I went into like a restaurant. I went to a restaurant called the Cajun Pier, you know, because I'm a Cajun. And, uh, and I went to the Cajun Pier and I met with the, with the owner and I said, hey, you got a great restaurant? You know, I said, I, I wrote you a jingle. Would you like to hear it? He goes, yeah, sure, I'd like to hear that jingle. So I played him the jingle and he goes, oh, that's really catchy. And I said, well, yeah, if you do a radio ad, you can use your jingle and it's going to be awesome, you know? So um, would you be willing to pay me, you know, X dollars for it? And he goes, pay you? Why would I pay you? You're a musician. Don't you just do that for fun anyway, you know? <laughs> I was like, oh, God. This is going to be a really tough racket to get into. So, But I did jingles for a while and uh, eventually I was going to school for music and I thought, that I'd go to California, and I thought I'd get involved doing movie scoring, I could break into that, or TV music. And, uh, and one day, just standing at the, uh, at the music hall in Louisiana, I had a complete epiphany. It was like a brainstorm moment where I was just like, what about video games? It would be like, it's gotta be easier to get involved with video games than major motion pictures. So, uh, and I think at the time that I did get involved, it was a bit easier. It was not a piece of cake. It was a long journey, but the very first gig I got was at Sierra Online, which, you know, you guys 
may not have ever heard of before, because many of you were not born, but you've heard of it, okay. So Sierra Online was very big in video gaming, and uh, I reached out to them, they reached out back out to me, and it took a long time. It was months and months and months. They make a game called King's Quest, and a bunch of other games that were very, very legendary games in the industry. Now I think that the owners of Sierra, Ken and Roberta Williams, live on a yacht somewhere, and they just write a blog, and it's kind of fun to, to think that I used to work you know, for them at that company. Uh, but yeah, so I thought that I had won the, the lottery ticket getting hired to write music for a living for Sierra Online. And, uh, and then, you know, when I got hired about a year later on, I ended up getting hired by Blizzard Entertainment. And then I thought I won, I won the Super Mega Lotto. It was like the progressive jackpot because that was a big, big move for me. And I, I've been at Blizzard, you know, for, gosh, I've been involved with them for like 20 years. So um, it's been an amazing so exactly, um, how many hours of World of Warcraft music have you composed? You know, not that much, relative to how much there is. There's about 60 hours of WoW music, which is just, you know, kind of disproportionately huge, but, you know, I think it's been going on now for 12 years, and we've added new music constantly. Every time there's a new patch, even a sub-patch of, a, of, a, of an expansion, we add new music, and it's always been that way. But, you know, for the original release of World of Warcraft that I was the lead composer on, uh, I had about two hours of music in that game. And I'd written, you know, probably ma the majority of that. But um, we had some other contributions from the staff composers at Blizzard. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was a healthy amount of music. But then they realized when the game really took off, maybe we should have, you know, more. And so we've just never stopped. So they've written so much music with that game. And I, I've contributed, I've pinch hit it, and I've contributed to music to WoW over the years. Even as I moved on to other things, I get back in and do a little bit more WoW music here and there and stuff. So it's been great. And when, when you were growing up and, you know, listening to music here and there, what inspired you? Like, what, what, would, what would you say was your influence? You know what? There's a few things that stand out, and I don't remember a lot of stuff when I was a kid. Like, my wife is amazing. She can remember, like, laying on her back and playing with a mobile when she was a baby in a crib, which I don't know how she does that, but I am the opposite. I don't remember anything. But there's certain key things I remember. You know, I remember basically uh, at my uncle's place in Louisiana, and he had this collection of music, and he had these extraordinary speakers. And I remember that um, I discovered this piece of music. It was from, it was you know, Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. The second movement, okay? And this is a killer piece of music, right? So it's such a great piece of music. And to me, that sounds really epic. I mean, like Beethoven, Seventh Symphony, second movement, really epic. And um, it's, it's known as the Allegretto movement. So that was awesome, and it stuck with me. And I just thought, there's something about that. It's really incredible. Of course, I was listening to like the genius of Beethoven, but I was, you know, like a kid. And then, you know, I remember they had a chorus line. They had like the movie musical. Like that musical was so successful on Broadway, but they made the, the movie and they had Michael Douglas in the movie. And the, the music was so good in chorus line. And I listened to that and it was so well produced and, and that was awesome. And so, you know, since, I mean, I've had so many influences and I love all kinds of music. One of my favorite composers of classical music is Rachmaninoff. Super, super huge inspiration for me. And uh, yeah, and in film music, I'm. A super fan of Jerry Goldsmith. I just think he's got the most gorgeous music uh, ever written for movies. Of course, I like John Williams like everyone else that I, I know does, which I love John Williams. But I mean, Jerry Goldsmith is the kind of writing that you hear it and I feel inspired and I feel a little depressed because I'm like, will I ever write anything that sounds remotely as moving as that is? So yeah, and I've learned a lot from Jerry. All right. Um, how do you find the right sound for the project that you're working on? It's an experiment. I mean, you know, one of the cool things about being involved at the game development studio, a lot of music composers will come in the very ending phase and they'll hire the composer to write some music for the game. But I haven't worked that way. I've always been involved from the very beginning. And like for World of Warcraft, I was in from the very beginning. Uh, even as they redesigned the initial starting zone, like Owen Force got redesigned, it was like 14 times or something. It was just so many times. And I was there from the very beginning writing music. And, you know, it's a lot of inspiration has come from working with that incredible team. It's like the first thing I worked on for a while, there was this beautiful piece of concept art that was of, you know, it was an Elwyn Forest concept. And uh, it was just a picture of this beautiful forest 
in the morning with the sunlight streaming through, through the trees. And that was gorgeous. And I was really thought that was super inspiring. And so I immediately went off and I wrote some music to that. And then, you know, then I've done a lot of the cinematics for Blizzard games. And, you know, that's a great cinematics team. Like, they do amazing work. And so being at an early meeting for those cinematics, you would watch them put their first ideas down. And it wouldn't look like much. It would be like just like there's like a character, right? Like they had a cinematic with Arthas. Do we have a lot of WoW players? Any WoW players? Yes. Oh, okay. So you know who Arthas is. Okay, so Arthas <laughs> is featured in one of the movies, right? In, in one of the earlier movies from Warcraft. This was in like the Warcraft 3 days, Warcraft 3 Frozen Throne. And they had a movie about the character Arthas. But the early version, it was just like, you know, I was looking at what was basically just a big you know, triangle cone, not even a head. And that was like, oh, that's going to be the head. You know? So that was a big triangle cone. In this, in this. So, oh, it's going to be a big close-up? Yeah, it's a close-up. And then, you know, it's going to look cool. And so then we go and we're watching the rest of it and they explain the story to me. And I'm looking at this very, very early primitive artwork. But that was super inspiring to hear them talk about it. And so I would write down sketches. And a lot of times at those meetings, you know, those story pitch meetings, I'll just start hunting ideas. I would always, I always have like a recorder with me. These days I use my iPhone and I use the voice recorder. And so I'd have to like be in a meeting hearing about this story pitch and I have to excuse myself and say, I'll be right back. And then I'll just like walk out of the room, get my recorder, start singing ideas into the recorder and then I'll come back and say, I'm so sorry, you know. I think I'm, who's now? Weird composer walking out of the room. I come back in, finish the meeting. And you know, sure enough, the ideas that I sing in at that time with that first impression of the story in some version oftentimes makes it into the final version, right? And so they'll develop the piece and, you know, that initial idea for Arthas's, you know, uh, oh, actually, the one with the big close-up of the big face was not Arthas. That was Illidan. That was the Illidan line in Frozen Throne. But yes, it was, but Illidan became a very big bad guy for, for Warcraft. And so they have a big close-up of Illidan's face. And so the idea came from an initial little thing I hummed into record. So you've already skipped, like, ahead to three of my other questions here. So let me, because I, I was going to ask you, um, so do you see the art first? Or do you compose music first? And you've explained that. Do you work with the developers as far as, or with Blizzard, if you come up with something, or do they totally trust your vision? Like as far as like the music goes, you get like 100% this is going in there? Or is it a collaboration like they, they might come to you and say, well, try this or that? Yeah, it depends on the game. I mean, at, at, at Blizzard, you know, I get to, you know, I, for the years that I was at Blizzard, I'm recently not at Blizzard anymore, I'm at Riot Games. Uh, I'm the music director of Riot Games now. But over the many years I was at Blizzard, I would basically, it, the different games have different requirements in terms of how much scrutiny there is. For World of Warcraft these days, I mean, as, as you know, the latest things I'd written for a while, I have gotten to the point now from years of working on it, also there's a certain amount of trust you build up because they have confidence in what I'm doing and I can go off and do whatever I want. Also. Like, there's so many types of things in World of Warcraft that whatever I write, even if it's not exactly right for the thing I'm writing for, because, oh, we don't want it to be this scary. We want it to be a little less scary. Well, I can do something new for that, but that thing I wrote that's just really scary, there's some place I can plug it in in the game that does feel that scary. So we have such a diverse range of areas in WoW that I can write something, and with pretty good confidence that it's going to fit somewhere, even if it's not the thing I intended it. And, and, you know, uh, so... Does your music sometimes influence the development of a game? Have you played them stuff and they're like, oh, we're gonna run with that to do this? And yeah, I've had the coolest experiences with that. I mean, like, I, I had left Blizzard for a while. I had done some other things, um, working at other companies. I uh, spent some time at Valve Software and I spent some time doing other things. But when I came back and I came back to World of Warcraft, it was during the Mists of Pandaria patch cycle, okay? So it's in the middle of like this fifth major expansion for the game. And they had this way of working that I was really surprised by because they say, okay, in this new storyline, we're going to have Jaina Proudmoore. She's one of the, you know, one of the classic characters from Warcraft. And I was like, oh, wow, Jaina, that's cool because I don't think Jaina's ever had a musical theme yet. And they said, well, no, she hasn't. I said, well, I want to write a theme for Jaina. And I'm like, okay, well, how's Jaina going to be used? Is Jaina going to be mad? Is Jaina going to be in love? Is Jaina going to be, you know... Uh, sad? What's going on with Jaina? They're like, well, we don't know yet. The designers are still working out what's going to happen with the storyline. But if you just write some music for Jaina, that'd be great. I'm like, well, I don't know what to do with that because I don't know how Jaina's feeling. I have no idea what to write. So I started working on music, a, a theme for Jaina. I know Jaina's become a rather bitter 
you know, intense, dangerous character because uh, she's had to basically defend her people and she's taken up, a, a, you know, she's a very powerful sorceress. But, you know, back in the day, she used to be in love with Arthas and she has that whole thing about caring for her people and she used to be in love. So I wanted to write something that would like talk about Jaina and her caring about her homeland and her, you know, having feelings that are, you know, these more lyrical feelings. So I wrote this theme, not knowing where they would use it, and I gave them the, the music. And you know what? They designed a whole quest line that, and they played that music verbatim, and I think, and I don't know for sure, but I think the way they wrote the quest and the way they wrote the little cinematic arc of the character, they were somewhat inspired to like, write a speech for her that's talking about how much she cares about her people and you know imagining the shining city on the hill and what this could be and you know, it was really lovely and it's I felt like I had an impact on the storytelling because I had just proactively written something for Jaina that ended up working out. Man, that's so cool. <laughs> Gosh, it's cool. Um, so how, how much do you go back and rework your own stuff during the process? Well, one thing I do is whenever I'm writing music, I can't tell like if it's any good at all. I mean, basically, I'll write it and then I'll, I'll, I'll get done with it. And I don't have any perspective on whether it works or not. Um, and I have to get away at least for half a day. And I'll come back to it and to listen to find out, does this make any sense? Right? Was I just, you know, was I just uh, not thinking straight? You know, am I crazy? What does this sound like? And when I hear it, it'll be like, oh, I can get an idea of what it actually sounds like, and I can hear whether I think it works or not. And at that point, when I hear it again, I can might maybe find things, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna rework this because I spent a little too long in this one thing, and I really need to kind of stick with this more intense rhythm section or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, I always have to get away from it to find out whether or not it's working, and I'll usually rework it at those times. Um, do you have any uh, favorite pieces of your own scores? Oh, well. You know, I mean, some things have become favorites because of the way they're used, even though they were never necessarily initially the thing that I was like the most, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily meant to be this favorite thing, but because of the way that it's used, like I'd written a, a theme for one trailer in 2001 for Warcraft 3, right? So it's a game before World of Warcraft. And I'd written a piece of music that was, um, it was a trailer and they had this moment where I wanted a big adventurous theme. I just felt like I can just feel epic, I can go conquer the world. So it was in that particular trailer and uh, the piece is called A Call to Arms. And that music ended up being used in so many ways by the head of marketing at Blizzard. His name uh, is Neil Hubbard and he used to be the head of marketing. And he told me one day, he says, man, you gotta write something new for me because I'm sick of using that darn Call to arms. I use it everywhere. But he's, he's tongue in cheek because he used it and it became like a signature for the Warcraft universe. And, you know, I mean, they'll do ads for World of Warcraft and they got Mr. T talking about being a Knight of Mohawk and they'll have Call to Arms playing in the background. And so it's like it became this really cool Call to Adventure theme. And so I have a fondness for that piece of music because of the way they, they used it. You know, and other things like that, some things have a special place because of that, you know. Definitely the character themes I love because they help tell the story in, in, in a cool way. So the theme for Arthas I feel really, you know, connected to because I really like the story of Arthas and I like helping to tell the story with music and I really felt, uh, you know, certain things I've written have been reused in other ways. Like the theme I wrote for Arthas was initially in the Frozen Throne uh, when he first becomes, you know, the Lich King. And then later on in World of Warcraft, Arthas becomes the chief guy in Wrath of the Lich King, and they revisited his theme. And Neil Aker, who's a great composer who's done work for us at Blizzard, he wrote the cinematic for that, for that Wrath of the Lich King cinematic. And he used my theme in the beginning, and so I got to kind of be involved in collaborating with Neil because he used my theme, and they had it sung this time by like a, a boy. And, and it was a beautiful vocal, and it's lovely. And so I love that. And then later on, Russell Brower, who's another composer at Blizzard, did another piece of music, which was you know, called Invincible. And it's about Arthas's horse. And it's a wonderful piece of music that plays the same Arthas theme. And it, it's a big choral arrangement. And so like being able to be part of this different pieces of music that use the same theme has been a really wonderful and satisfying thing. OK. Do you have a dream franchise that you'd like to work on? I have one that I almost worked on and I had to turn down. Can you say it? Can you yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had a chance 
to work on Metal Gear Solid uh, during Peace Walker. And uh, a guy who was in charge of getting music for the game contacted me and he said, man, I want you to work on this. I've got 20 minutes. Do uh, you have Metal Gear Solid fans? <laughs> Peace Walker, yeah. Yeah, so he's got 20 minutes of the cinematics and I'm saving them just for you. This is like intense, we got like, you know, nuclear launch about to go off deal. We got like tragedy. We got, you know, this kind of really, really intense emotion and I want you to work on it. And man, I just, I was so sad to turn it down. I mean, I, I literally thought about trying to take a leave of absence from Blizzard for a while and <laughs> go off and do Peace Walker because that would have been a dream thing to work on. But, uh, but no, I mean, you know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and, and fortunate enough. It was okay. I had to turn it down. I would have liked to work on that. Do you have any favorite video game soundtracks outside of your own stuff? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, you know, I don't know about my own stuff. Well, your own you know, stuff's pretty great. You know, well, it's <laughs> so, cool to say, but yeah. So the thing is, I mean, I, I have certain things that are really special to me, like the Banjo-Kazooie soundtrack is very special to me because I remember playing that game and, you know, that was like a long time ago and the music was so catchy and so bouncy and such great tunes, like great melodies. And, you know, you do this thing where you're walking around, you know, above ground and the music would be bouncing along and really cool and fun. And then you would jump in the water and the music would continue, but it would change and morph into like the underwater version of the music. And it was like, it was interactive and it was like brilliant. And you come out of the water and the music would keep going, but it would become bouncy again. And it's the same exact music going. And, you know, like years later, I got to be friends with Grant Kirkhope, who's the composer for Banjo-Kazooie. And so, you know, I get to tell him now how much, you know, I love his music. And uh, that's neat about the video game industry, you know. Having worked in it for a long time, I've become friends with a lot of the composers, so. it's awesome. Couple more questions, then we'll open up the mic. So if you guys want to start lining up with any type of thoughts, anything, feel free to. Um, so now that we've covered that and we've gone through your extensive background, tell us about your band Critical Hit that you're involved with. Right, okay, so Critical Hit's a fun side project. I'm really loving it. It's like, I started this band with a buddy of mine named Michael, and Michael Gluck is a friend of mine who goes back a ways doing cons, playing music. His favorite music to play from video games, he used to play at cons on piano, is uh, music from Final Fantasy. And so he went by the name Piano Squall. He'd be in cosplay, <laughs> and he would play Final Fantasy music. And so we came together, and we decided to start a group together. And it's great, because like I went and I found musicians, a lot of the amazing musicians who have played on the video game scores that I've, I've, I've worked on, and just finding the best players I can find. And we, we have this amazing group. And we play all video game music. So we play not just my stuff, we play some of my music, but we also play, you know, from Zelda to Halo to just, we play Tetris. And we have a killer version of Angry Birds. Yeah, I, that's okay. Yeah. Killer version. I mean, it's like, if you, if you, you know, if you think Angry Birds is just like Angry Birds, man, we, we really have fun with it. And Ari, who's the composer of the Angry Birds theme, contacted me to say, you know what? I love your version of Angry Birds. So, yeah. So we, we're having a great time. We played a lot of events and things, and um, we've gotten to do South by Southwest, and we've gotten to do uh, in Australia at the Supernova, which is a really cool pop culture convention. And um, Yeah, so we have a great time with it. Okay, guys. Seriously, this morning, all morning long, I, I was watching Critical Hit, the Angry Birds, is the one that I was like, I, okay, that's it. That's like, fun stuff. It's the way that you it's just and then I watched some of your rehearsals that you put up on there yeah, yeah. and your group is so tight I was like <laughs> I mean uh, there's a lot coming from you too well no the, the, the uh, girl on the cello oh yeah Tina Guo oh my gosh yeah and, she's amazing uh, and so it, I, you know later tonight when you guys are decompressing from all this YouTube critical hit I'm telling you guys blew me away you know what I'm missing today it bumps me out I'm actually missing, and I'm, I'm happy to miss it because I'm so glad I'm at, at, at Solid Gaming Con. But I was invited to a video shoot, right? Because my friend Tina, who plays in Critical Hit and does a million other things, uh, she's doing a video of, uh, of a tune that she recorded from Warcraft. So she took a, she took a, a mashup of two of my, my tunes. One's the main Legends of Azeroth theme from WoW, and she took the tavern music uh, oh, and the Lion's Pride, and she combined them. And she did killer version and so she's doing a video of it today and I could have gone to the video shoot see that guys he's here he turned it down he could have been in that and, and who knows where that would have launched you 
It's because you're not there, but you're here with us. Oh, it'll be everywhere, though. Maybe we can all enjoy it when it comes out. That's so. Uh, yeah, no, it's good. I'm so glad to be here. All right, so we're going to open the mic for the rest of the time and just have a conversation. So uh, just, you know, tell us your name, and Jason is all yours. Thank you. So I'm Melinda. Um, I'm glad right. you mentioned Metal Gear Solid because... Two years ago, Rika, who did a lot of the music for that, was here as a guest. Oh. And she was saying that when they were giving her instructions on what kind of music they wanted, they'd say, we need something scary. And so she'd send them something, and then they'd say, okay, that's scary, creepy. We wanted scary, suspenseful. And that was like all the direction she had, according to her, to compose. So obviously that's really a contrast to what you've had with Blizzard. Have you had any other companies besides Blizzard where they kind of gave you that little bit of, like, that little bit of direction? Well, things have evolved at Blizzard. Like, I mean, a long time ago, the kind of direction I get at Blizzard was really interesting. I, mean, it, I think that, that they'd get a kick out of this, actually, this kind of feedback. So I, I get called into a meeting, and I'm talking with Matt Samia, who is, you know, he was a cinematic director. And he's like, you know what, Jason? I just want this... When this thing plays, I want it to sound like the violin players are banging their violins on the stands. Music stands, that's what it's just banging on the stands. That's what I want it to sound like. I'm like, do you literally want it to sound like violin players are banging their violins on stands? Or is that a metaphor? Or what is it? He goes, I just want it, you know, I want it to sound like, I want it to sound like, you know, Tom Waits. You know, Tom Waits, and he's been drinking whiskey for like, you know, 40 years. And I want the music to sound like Tom Waits' voice. And I'm like... Okay. So, yeah, and the thing is, I remember thinking, like, that is ridiculous. So, so when he left the, the meeting, I didn't know what he... And so I told Glenn, who I worked with Glenn for years, who's an amazing composer, I said, Glenn, that was the most stupid feedback I've ever heard in my life. And then suddenly, in walks Matt back in, he goes, what did you say? I heard you say that. And I was like... So I was, like, I was in hot water with Matt because I was insulting his feedback, so... Yeah, but Matt and I have been in fences, and now I get along great. And he goes, he goes much better direction now than he used to. Thank you. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Anthony, and uh, my question for you is, are there any scores slash tracks that are currently being used in games that you don't like? Oh, that's good. I like that. You know, <laughs> the biggest problem I have with music that's done for games that's not that I don't like is usually the way it's used. Right, because it's like, I, I will hear sometimes like really great music, but it's, it's implemented and it's used in a way that's not good. And so I don't want to pick on any, it's not even picking on the composer because I like the music actually, uh, but I still don't want to pick on the, on, the, on the composer. But yeah, I had heard this music being done that was like very, lots of this kind of woodwind flourishes and all kinds of stuff going on, and it was lovely. It was really great, and I thought it was really creative writing. But the problem is, it was being used in a situation in a game where it would play, like, like, forever. And you could stay in an area forever. And it's like, I just could imagine if I was playing the game and that music was playing, it wouldn't last long. I, I'd be, it would be a problem, right? So, that would be very aggravating. And so that's why, you know, a big guiding principle with, with the World of Warcraft uh, music was like, you know, I'd done a lot of cinematics at Blizzard and a lot of these kind of big, epic trailer pieces, but I knew that I did not want to have something that's hitting you over the head too hard because if you're going to be in an area for a long time, you know, if we're lucky, people will hang out and, and want to hang out in the world. You can't have music that's going to be, be that aggressive. It's got to blend in, like almost be like a lighting effect or like, you know, the fog. It's just something you just don't want to do without. It's just, you just kind of have it there. So yeah, I mean, the best compliment I've ever gotten about any of the music in, in that game is that, you know, I've left my, my music on. I've always loved it. Because that's a really, that's a, that's a really big thing to say. Because I can understand, and now after 12 years, it's like, it's hard to imagine, you know, someone not wanting to like fire up some other random thing and, and play it instead. So it's great to do music that people actually want to leave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good question. Thanks, man. Hi, I'm Bob, and I'm an indie game developer. Hi. And so I've always believed that music should be composed for the video game. And just wondering if you had advice on looking for artists to help that. Yeah. You know, one of the coolest things to, to know about getting music for, for a game, if you've got even a low budget, you know, the cool thing about it is a lot of times developers, big developers, 
they want to own the music. They just want to like, they want to buy the music, they own it outright, and that way there's no red tape to deal with. And I can understand the impulse to do that, but you know, with music, there's so many rights that are involved. And it's not just owning the music outright. You can license the music and use it indefinitely in your game and still not own everything about the music, right? It could still be used in other ways. Someone could still use that music and they could go use it for the background of maybe like a movie trailer, or they could use it for a variety of other things. So my point is, you can, for very little money, you can license music from someone. If you really want them to write music for the game, they could write music for your game. But if you agree to let them retain the rights to their music, they can sell a soundtrack. Maybe they can share the profits with you, and they still have the ability to participate in that way. Or maybe they retain the ownership so they could use it for a movie trailer for something else. And you know, you get maybe unlimited use in the game for a fraction of the price of what it would take to own the music outright. And that can be a really good strategy. And as far as getting great music, they have basically so many composers out there wanting to find their first break. So, and a lot of them descend is there, on like a website. Well, a big a big place to go places? is the, the Game Developers Conference. If you go to the Game Developers okay. Conference, which is you know they have them all over now, I think, but the big one is in San Francisco, and right. it happens around you know end of oh well, it's a February March time. Frame. I was going to say it was a couple months ago, right? Yeah, yeah February yeah. March is, is when it's going to happen, and uh, yeah, and it's like. You have a lot of people that go there. They're looking for work. A lot of composers that would uh, be very happy to talk to you. Cool, thank you. All right. I'm Justin. Mark, I think I, I have a cassette tape of yours. Would that make sense? Yes, it does. I've got them with me. Really, honestly, you got to listen to this guy's stuff. It's <laughs> Thanks, so man. Cool. I really want to check it out. Really cool. You would dig it. If yeah. anyone in here yeah. has a Walkman and you, you raise your hand, I'll give you a tape. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. That's yeah, I appreciate really it. Really for good real. stuff. Thanks. Oh. A um, question for, for you, um, can you tell us a little bit about your process? Do you start in Pro Tools? At what point do you actually get lucky enough to stand in front of an orchestra? Like, what, what is your normal process from first melody on a keyboard? Like, what are your tools or your process? I can tell you. For, so for me, the way it works is, um, at this point, a lot of times I have this like arsenal of gear, right? I can basically mock up the sound of an orchestra all on a keyboard with a bunch of sounds, and I've got like a bunch of synthesis, you know, synthesizers, you know, ones that live in software that I can use. So many sounds, and they make so many, they make new sounds all the time. So you get, you know, all these sounds you can use, and it becomes overwhelming for me. I'm just like, I got so many options, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I can't imagine how I'm gonna start. So usually I leave all that behind. I get away from the studio, I go take a walk or a jog, and I'll hum ideas into the recorder. That's what I do. And so I, ideas always start with me at that, at that situation. So I'll sing an idea, I'll think about the character or the situation or whatever it is, and I'll sing some ideas in. These are not recordings I really care ever with anybody, because I'm not a great singer. So do you have this recorder with you? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, I have the recorder, but my recordings are not going to be fired. Who's got, the, yeah, who's got the audio line? We're going to patch this in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, I'll sing these things, and the thing is, I'll sing and I'll suggest like random rhythm parts, and I'll sing, you know, what's going on with the melody, and I mean, it's really, it's probably hilarious to listen to, but I, it, it basically gives me an idea of what I'm thinking about the music. And then I'll take it back to the studio, and I'll have that, that recording, and I'll refer to it, and I'll start writing. I mean, once you get a great idea, the rest is a piece of cake. And, um, but so the thing I'll do is I keep going as I start fleshing it out and developing it, maybe working on the parts and the strings and the brass and everything. You know, if I don't have that recording, then I've got no kind of beacon to like steer me back in the right direction. So it's easy to start just going off in this direction. And you might get off the path a bit and you might lose your way. So if I got that recording, I can remind myself of that beacon. Oh, that's what I was thinking. And I can come back to it and, and it'll keep me kind of around that framework. And it's a, it's, it's, if I've got a great initial idea on a, even a horrible recording of, of me, then I've got something I can build on. Because I hear a lot of music now a lot of great music is written out there. A lot of great sounding music is being written by a lot of people. But a lot of times that music will have the veneer of nice music, right? It has like this kind of window dressing feel to it. And it, and it might sound polished because it's getting easier and easier to write things that sound pretty polished. But if there's not anything that's inspiring that is like a really good, solid musical idea that's fueling it, then it can just be a lot of a lot of polish without any real substance. So, you know, you can hear things that don't have a lot of heart and soul. 
So I don't want to write like that. I want to make sure that what I'm writing has some kind of thing that got me excited and I was inspired by. And once I have that, and then I dress that up with great production, then you can get all my speeches. Awesome. Thank you. Good question. Thanks. Did, hey, you sat back down. Did he take your question? Oh, man. <laughs> think, think of another one. We've got tons of time. All right. So my name's Raven. Um, I am wondering, what kind of instruments do you use and how many of them in your things? Yeah, so I have this giant template that I use when I'm writing. It's huge, right? We're talking like just, I don't know, right now it's maybe about 150 tracks. But I don't write with all those at the same time. And so I have everything loaded in that I might want. So, you know, I've got my string section, I've got my brass, I've got my winds, I've got synthesizers, I've got various things. And then, like, a lot of times with, the, with, these, with these instruments, you know, like a violin can play in so many ways. I mean, it's such a versatile instrument. So I'll have a sound of the violin playing a very legato, smooth sound that I can use those smooth notes. But if I want pizzicato, like a plucked sound on a violin, I might have a whole different sound for that. So I might have this whole bank of sounds that are just trying to describe what a violin can do. And so I'll use all those sounds. Um, but you know, in the actual process of writing it, I might only use 30 or 40 sounds. It just, just the ones that I need for that piece of music. Um, and yeah, so do that. And then you know, you go to record with an orchestra, and so you know, you end up with a, a whole room full of awesome musicians, like 86 players, and that's a rush to be there and hear that come to life with all those people lending their own individual cool. musicality to it is a, is a great experience. Mm. Thanks. Hey, so I'm a composer myself, audio engineer, and uh, I was just kind of wondering, I threw this a similar question at the uh, voice acting panel, but I figure it's better because you're actually a composer. Um, I was wondering, what's the best way to find like new games that indie developers are coming out with? Because I know they don't put them on their websites or anything, unless they're like in progress and have a composer, have all this. Like, are there certain specific hub, specific hubs or like online sources or specific ways to go? To For find you to them? find games that need a composer? Yes. Oh yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's a trade organization called Gang, the Game Audio Network Guild, G A N G, and that organization is pretty cool because, you know, at an event like GDC which is a really great event to meet people that are making games. It's nice to have a cool place to land where you've got friends and a social network and Gang provides that. So you can join Gang, go to GDC, and you'll find a lot of meetups around that. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of hook up, hook up with these people and stuff and, you know, and do that. Of course, you're not gonna find much work just hanging out with a bunch of other composers, but it's, it's a good support system. And then you get out there and you basically you know, you go and you hang out where the designers are and the audio directors are and the different producers are and, uh, and you'll find a lot of people that make decisions about music there. And you just hand out a lot of business cards and you collect a lot of business cards. And, uh, and then afterwards, I, I wouldn't hand out a bunch of flash drives yeah. or a bunch of CDs, we even use those anymore. I wouldn't hand out Cassette that. tapes? Yeah, I wouldn't hand out your cassette yeah, tapes or flash doesn't. drives because the thing is, I mean, those will get lost. And, and you know, can you just imagine how, how people are just carrying all these things, they're like, they'll, they'll, they'll lose it. You just want to make an impression on your personality. And you seem like a cool guy, and that's, what, that's the impression you want to leave with people. And maybe talk about yourself and find out about them, and afterwards follow up with a lot of email. Just email that, that card and say, hey, I really enjoyed meeting you. I'm the guy who does basket weaving. Whatever was unusual about you, it would be memorable, right? And just ask you to send your music to them, and you'd love to share it just to get their feedback, just to hear what they have to say. You'd love some feedback. You're starting out, and then uh, you bother them every two weeks until they respond. So it's very convention based. Like you really want to go to those. And oh yeah, well that's that, the main marketing. That one in particular. That yeah, game. See, yeah, because yeah. the thing is, you can go to another one like E3, which is a huge, awesome event, and they have a lot of great games, and it's an exciting place to be. But that's not the place you want to go because that's where all the marketing teams are going to show off their games to the press. They don't want to talk with an up and coming developer because it's not even the people you, want, you really need to meet. Although it's a great place to go for fun, it's not a place to meet developers that can hire you for music. So E3 I wouldn't suggest, but GDC I would. Yeah, have, you. have you already uh, composed stuff then? Uh, yeah, I do. Do you have a website? Uh, yeah, I do. Shout it out. AudioWithdrawal.com. There you go. Cool. cool. Hey, uh, so you started out right 
relatively recently. Very recently. And was there any, they, they've done a bunch of different types of music, like um, orchestra stuff or music videos with pretty renowned singers and whatnot. Is there anything that you heard that you thought like, oh wow, that's really cool. I, I want to try and do my, like take my shot at this or work with them, like any specific piece? You know what, I think, I've learned a lot about Riot in my brief time there and I've been amazed with how diverse, like, the, do we have a lot of League of Legends players? Couple? Okay, yeah, the diversity of the champions, right, in that game is incredible. We have like 135 or whatever it is, champions. And it's like, there's so much diversity, right? They had a, a thing they released, it was like a whole music video around one of our champions named Jinx. Yeah. And it was this really cool song, and it was not like what you'd expect, you know, in what's essentially a fantasy world, but this was like totally at odds, and that character was unusual and, and awesome, right? Or like the total punk thing they did for Vi was awesome. So there's all kinds of different music. So I'm super delighted that they've got so much going on, and there's so many styles of music that can be at home in that situation. But, you know, it's like, I didn't know that much about Riot before I went to go work for them. I, I, uh, I knew of League of Legends, um, but I didn't play it yet. Now I'm playing. Um, like everyone else at Riot, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working at learning the game and I'm having a great time. But they had approached me. I was basically getting ready to work on the latest expansion for WoW. It's, it's seven, Legion is seven. So the patch I was about to work on is 7.3. So I was on 7.3, I had the music set that I was gonna do, and, uh, and I was working on that, and that was great. And it was not even on my mind about looking for anything else. And I got contacted by uh, a guy at Riot, who's a friend of mine, who said, man, would you begin to talk with us because I really want someone who can come in here and help lead our music team kind of into the future. So he said, I've got no one else in mind because you're the one guy I can think of that I think would be perfect to do this here. And I'm like, well, oh my gosh, that's such a great thing to say. Of course, I'm going to come talk with you guys. And, uh, and the more I got to know more about the company, the more excited I got. So that's how I came to Ryan. Sweet. Well, best of luck. Hope yeah. you enjoy your new job. Thank you, man. Thank you. Great question. So uh, what was your experience like when you first learned music theory and all that stuff? Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I went to a school called University of North Texas, which is in Denton, Texas. It's a great music school. I mean, that school, they've got music going on every night of the week. I mean, whether you want to see like Baroque, old school music, you know, uh, or whether you want to see like just jazz, uh, a lot of jazz at UNT, great jazz, and just everything in between. And um, I really, like, I really dove into the theory classes. I really enjoyed them because it opened up a whole new way of thinking about music. I mean, I had taken some piano lessons when I was a kid. And then my, my piano teacher moved away. And then I was out of piano lessons. So I really went for a long time not with piano lessons. And I was learning by ear. I was playing things by ear and I used my ear a lot. And uh, so the first time I got serious about studying music was in college. I mean, I was, you know, I was definitely a late bloomer in that way. But um, I, I, I love the, the music theory stuff and I really ate it up. So uh, a great school for that. And, uh, and it was definitely eye-opening to have that and to have a framework with which to think about all the things I was already observing about music by ear and be able to give a, kind of a theoretical way to figure it out. So yeah, yeah, yeah I love music theory. I've had a really similar experience because I was uh, originally studying computer science but I uh, realized like, I'm pretty bad at programming so I switched to music not knowing much theory and then uh, that's when I got serious too. Um, I played in high school and just, but it was kind of casual. We didn't really have any theory classes. I went to a really small high school so it was kind of so what did you play when you were when you were playing? Drums, guitar. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. we got something in common because my first major was computer science. <laughs> yeah, and then and you know it was computer science for about half a semester, and it was computer engineering for about a quarter of a semester. <laughs> I was like, this is not for me. And um, but I thought I had to get a respectable job. I thought I had to do something that was going to be able to make a living. But the music was still calling out for me, and I wanted to do it so bad. Yeah. I just gave in at some point. I said, well, I'm just going to go for this music thing and you know who knows and I've been extremely fortunate uh, to, to work in music but uh, yeah I, I really had managed expectations about how I could make a living as a, as a musician so well thanks that gives me some hope yeah, yeah. <laughs> it can't be done I was wondering what was your favorite video game that you ever composed music for a favorite game I've written music for well yeah I mean I mean, it's, it's, it's hard not to, I have such a warm and fuzzy feeling about, about 
wow because of the player community that plays it and how passionate those players are. It's, it's been an amazing thing to basically be involved with a game like that that reaches so many people. And, you know, like I was telling someone earlier, it's like, you know, as a, as a composer or a musician, you want to communicate emotion. That's what you want to do. And so, like, the, the honor of having such a large community of passionate people to communicate emotion to has been the most incredible thing in the world. So I guess, wow, it's, it's kind of hard to beat that. Yeah, and I've read a lot of, you know, doing my research, uh, reading comments. I mean, all over the world, people like, you know, this music's helped me out, you know, during a rough time. Thank you. I mean, that's got to be, it's got to feel good <laughs> yeah. to provide that for someone, you know. It's yeah. like a backdrop to their life. That's pretty cool. Yeah, someone told me, I've heard some amazing things. And people getting married and having their music at their wedding because maybe they met in the game and they met up in real life and they formed like a real world. I mean, that's, that's it's incredible, right? It's just yeah. amazing. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's all. And the thing is, you don't even realize, you know, it's the fact that you get the kind of numbers, especially like with, with League of Legends. And we're talking about like 100 million people every month playing this game. So you can't even imagine the people that are playing this game. It's just, it's massive. So, I mean, you know, WoW's really big, League is really big, and um, yeah, it's an, it's an awesome thing. And it's cool because, you know, both Blizzard and Riot are really into, really into the community of players. I mean, very much so. And so it's, it's great to, to work for companies that are, care a lot about, about the players. Uh, Riot cares passionately about their players. It's, it's such a huge part of the mantra at the company. It's like, it's, everything is, is really geared around the community of players. It's pretty cool, man. Yeah, very cool. So do you have any compositions that you've written that you don't like, that you just can't listen to anymore? Yeah, I like that one. That's yeah. really good. Uh, okay, so... I had written a piece of music for a club. I was hard to write music for a club called Senor Frog. <laughs> so... My senior frog theme is not my highest moment <laughs> in my musical life. I mean, you know, it was all right. I was very young, and I was lucky to get the work at did, all. Did you have to do lyrics for it, too? No, I would have liked to do, I, no, what I was going to do, senior frog, he's your party amphibian. I don't know what I was going to do, but no, I mean, <laughs> it would have been worse if it would have been higher than the lyrics for it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So I've had my not stellar moments, but yeah. <laughs> Great question. Hello, uh, my name's Sean. This is kind of a basic music question. Uh, we never really talk about why we have music, and, uh, and you know, it's in, you know, it sounds so simple, but that's pretty complicated. Well, I think when, when I play um, Zelda, Breath of the Wild, if I see a guardian, you know, they play that music, so the first thing my reaction is, you know, is I cringe and run and run, you know, it's just the reaction. But I guess I want, if you're trying to deliberately cause us, just, like, that's one thing I like about Diablo, the music in it, you know, it's just very... You know, it's kind of creepy, you know, that the tone uh -huh. for how you're going to react. You know, it's just an emotional response. But how do you determine what kind of music will provoke the response that you want the, the gamer to feel? You yeah. Know, it's kind of, kind of pretty complicated. Great well, question. Well, it's interesting because, yeah, I mean, really, in music, I call them cheap tricks. I mean, there are cheap tricks that you can use that when you're in a bind and you've got a deadline and you've got to write some music for something, you can go to the cheap trick, right? So, I mean you hope that you aspire to high art and to do something wonderful and fantastic. But sometimes the cheap trick will get you out of a bind. So, you know, with scary music, a very, very low, very bassy drone is extremely unsettling. And, you know, even if you don't put much thought into it, if you do that very low frequency kind of drone, it's very easy to become unnerving pretty fast because it's an unsettling sound. It's an unsettling thing to have. So, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, there are certain go-to things you can grab onto, right? If you're working on some kind of very spacey, ethereal um, thing, right? I've gotten certain harmonic language that I go to that, that to me evokes the sound of, you know, kind of beauty in space or whatever. And so sometimes it's a starting place for me. And, and I'll go with that knowing that this is going to kind of give me part of what I need. And then hopefully from that cheap trick starting point, you then get some inspiration to do something that's really kind of inventive. So, and, and, and hopefully I've had a few moments like that too, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, when you're writing commercially where you need to like please a client, right? And it's like, I don't just, I'm not just sitting on a hilltop writing music for my own enjoyment, right? I have to make sure it works for my client. 
Um, and I'm kind of grateful for that, because if someone left me on a mountaintop and said, just go and write your music, I mean, I would never get anything done. I, I, I'm a horrible procrastinator. I'm terrible. So I really need that deadline to say, you know what? We need this thing on Tuesday. And, uh, and so, you know, whether I panic and I'm scared and I don't know if I'll write anything good or not and will it be horrible and I'm an imposter or whatever, no matter what, on Tuesday, it's going to be done, right? And it may be not so good. It may be fantastic. But either way, I know it's going to be done. And, and I've learned over the years of doing it that I can feel comfortable knowing that, you know what, it's okay. On Tuesday, I'll be done with this thing. And uh, you have to be relaxed and have fun with it or else nothing good's going to come. So uh, I've learned to kind of chill out about my own paralysis about creativity. So, Great question. Hi, I'm, oh goodness, sorry, I'm Mallory, not Hi. oh goodness. Oh, oh goodness. Um, I was wondering, how do you deal with rejection when you create something that you genuinely are proud of, but someone tells you, no, that's not good enough? Oh man, you know what? And that's difficult because, you know, in my earlier days, in my earlier days, um, I've always been really passionate. And that passion has a double-edged sword. I'd go to these meetings and I'd have an idea that I had come up with this idea that was just perfect for what they need. It's just perfect, it's gonna be great. And I'll meet with the people and they may not see it my way, they may have a different idea. And, and I'll be like, well, no, I understand what you're saying, but this thing is perfect for what you need and this is why. And, and, you know, and after a while of like trying to convince people of that, it almost sounds like you're arguing and <laughs> you might be seen as a little bit stubborn and, you know, I've learned that if they don't go for something, then I need to, like, listen and just understand what they're saying. Because sometimes they don't have the words to convey what they want to convey. But they have an idea, and it's my job to understand their vision. Because really, at the end of the day, I'm in service of a bigger vision that I get to be a part of, but it's their thing, too. So if I'm hitting a brick wall with that, then I just try to like take a step back and be open to the new ideas and be willing to rework things. Another thing that I learned which was really helpful is one time I went into a meeting where I had a piece of music. This was for like StarCraft, okay? This was like one of the games I worked on at Blizzard. Back in 1998, I worked on StarCraft. And they had an ending movie and it was for basically a really pivotal ending scene of the game. And it was a really cool scene because one of the heroes, his name is Tassadar, he's on a ship and you just know that he's going to be sacrificing. He's going to be giving his life to save his people. And so in the midst of the situation, there's a huge attack you know, by the enemy faction, the Zerg, or coming in there attacking. And the guy's by himself. And I had this idea, this would be so good if in the middle of this battle, you have a calm moment where he's just contemplating his situation. And this somber, almost sad moment of music as he considers what he's got to do. And then it's going to end with a bang, right? So... I knew they probably wouldn't go for it because it was way too touchy-feely and they wanted probably something a lot more visceral. So I wrote a sketch of music that was what I thought that they wanted based on what I thought they would want. It was action, it was propulsion, it was like the attack is happening on the ship. And I, and I did that and I met with the guy and I said, okay, here's a sketch of something, what do you think? And he heard it and he's like, Oh, yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, propulsive, you get action going. Yeah. So, I mean, he liked it, right? And I was like, okay, now that you know that I can give you what you want for this, can I play something different that's a different take on this that's not what you're expecting? And he goes, well, sure, because he already knew that I understood where he was coming from. So I played my alternate thing, and he said, you know what? Let's go for yours. So it was an awesome moment, and I got to the ending movie features the idea that I had. So, if I would have made the other sketch, though, I may have never gotten to that point. So. That's great. That's Thank cool. you. Yeah. All right. We've got, like, three minutes left. So, last two questions right here. And uh, then we'll wrap it up. Blizz gone. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Adam. I spend about eight to ten hours a day writing software. And I like to listen to a lot of Blizzard soundtracks while I do that. Oh, that's my awesome. question for you is, what is your favorite World of Warcraft zone music? You know what? Uh... I really liked Teldrassil because, you know, when I was working on all these zones and ideas, I had this whole balancing act of like, it's, it's got to sound like it's not going to get too irritating, but it's also got to sound musical. It can't just be texture because texture is boring. You, you're not going to have anything musical going on. So it's this kind of fulcrum of like, I wanted to write evocative music, but I didn't want to be too busy. And so I had to find a sweet spot. 
So I felt like I tried a lot of things, and I felt intelligent, so I really hit, hit a sweet spot where I could convey this kind of night elf starting zone in a way that was emotional, but yet wouldn't be too grating. So I like the, the kind of where it landed. So um, there's a few I like a lot, but that has a special place for me. Great. Thank you. Last question. So I have a background in animation, and um, we often talk about Mickey Mousing within animation. I mean, syncing the beats up really uh, well with the music. And I was curious, in, uh, in your work, I mean, making music that ha can evolve and kind of be, uh, you know, involved with the action. I mean, obviously, when you're scoring something that's already been done, that's different than scoring a game. And I was curious what you had to say towards your experiences with that or which direction you prefer to approach it, whether they say, here's all our canned animations, hit the beats, versus here's my music, uh, if you want to animate to that. You know, you know kind of, yeah. you know, there's different directions to take. I mean, I've been lucky to have certain moments where I'll write something and it'll inspire someone to do something, but more often than not, that's not the case. I, I work with what they, they give me and I write music that conforms to that. If I'm really lucky, we'll have a situation where they'll have some previs work they do where they're not locked in yet. They do this thing, I can write music and say, you know what, if I had half a second longer for this one moment, or if I had like two more seconds here, I can really make this happen. And if they're malleable enough to change that, that's an awesome thing. So I, if I can go back and forth with them, that's fantastic. But it's interesting about this idea of being on the nose with the action and stuff. Like, a lot of times when you're scoring stuff, you don't want to be that on the nose. You want to basically try to find a way to explore the emotional side of it, but you know, not completely in the way that's completely on the nose. But it's become quite a trend recently in, in film trailers. I mean, some of the film trailers now, it's become really fashionable to be extremely on the nose. Like, it's almost for comedic effect. And the thing is, when you do that kind of thing, where you're following the action that specifically, it's kind of funny because that's part of the effect. So like the first time I saw it was like one of the early parts of the Caribbean movies. And the guy's got his sword and he's like, bam, 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 bam. And every single hit is like the sword swipe, which was, you know, hilarious. Cause it's like, that's kind of comedic, but it was really effective because that, that movie's got a bit of a tongue in cheek feel to it. So yeah. Thank you. Cool. All right, guys, we have to wrap it up. Let's give it up to Jason Hayes today. Thank you to Salt Lake City. Um, so where can, all of these fine people find you out there? Yeah, right between 400 area, okay. three, 400. I mean, this whole area, we got all the really interesting, amazing voice actors, so I'm with all of them. All right, and uh, we're gonna be doing a full-on video game music panel at 4 p.m., room 300C. So if you're into that, 4 p.m. Have a good con. Thanks for uh, having us here. Enjoy your day.